Before we have our study tonight, let me remind you that this Tuesday is a very critical election in the state of New Jersey. There are voter guides here. If you did not get one in your bulletin this morning, please pick one up. Please examine it carefully. And please vote for candidates who most closely parallel the things that God's word commands. And so we commit that to you as we have committed that election to the Lord as well. Now please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 12, looking at verses 18 and 19, the message entitled, Taken in an Evil Snare. Taken in an Evil Snare. Before we begin, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your mercies and grace. And yet, we know that men are taken in an evil snare when it falls upon them. They don't know the time that it's going to happen. And it may come suddenly, as the book of Proverbs has very clearly outlined for us, like a bird caught in an evil snare. So things happen to people that they're not expecting. Judgments arise that they were not anticipating. Political situations turn around overnight. And suddenly, because they have not been paying attention, they are caught and swept away. We pray, Father, that you will make us a wise and prudent people, both individually and corporately, so that we might not be taken in an evil snare when it falls upon us. Help us to be alert, men who know the times, those who understand what's happening in the world around us, those who understand the way in which it fits in your prophetic time scheme, those who believe the word of God concerning things to come, so that we might be wise in doing what is not only righteous in your sight, but also for the benefit of the body of Christ. We thank you, Father, for this time tonight, and we pray that you will bless it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, two weeks ago, as you know, on October 20th, we looked at that passage in verses 12 through 17, a message entitled, O Ye of Little Faith. Last week, of course, was the uh, Grand Choir Concert. Thanks to Brother McCoy for uh, leading that group of volunteers. They did a great job. Thank you so much. But two weeks ago, O Ye of Little Faith, as we saw a prayer meeting taking place, it was a prayer meeting in a home. People opening their homes for the church. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen very often anymore, and most people complain when it does, because they'd rather not go to the trouble, or else they'd rather not go to the house. But we saw it taking place, and we saw God answering prayer in a very specific and very powerful way. Not general prayer, but specific prayer. Not prayer for the world at large or missionaries somewhere out there, but for a specific man. And God answering prayer the very night that the prayer meeting was going on, and in that very night, not only answering prayer, but bringing the one for whom they were praying to that specific house of all the thousands of places that he could have gone. And how often we do not see the results of our prayers because we do not really pray. Because we have no genuine petitions that we bring before the Lord that we see no answers because we're not praying. We're simply mouthing things mindlessly that we are not putting our heart and soul into. And yet they saw an answer to prayer in verses 12 through 17 when Peter was delivered from prison to them. And we noted two weeks ago that two of my favorite teenagers in the entire New Testament are mentioned for us in those verses there, John, Mark, and Rhoda little rosebush. She was probably between 11 and 15 years old. Uh, she's very clearly unmarried from the terms that are used about her in the text. John Mark, from what we later learn of him, was probably between 17 and 19 years old when these things occurred. And they may have been, though we can't prove it, brothers and sister, uh, because it was their mother's house where this was taking place. Uh, and she, Rhoda, went to the door to answer the door, as a little girl who was used to answering the door at her own home would have done. But the important thing that we noted out of that was that both of those young teenagers, 
Both of them were part of prayer meeting. Both of them were there involved in the life of the church that was having an impact, a powerful impact, in their own home. Christian parents who want their children to follow Christ in maturity need to have their children deeply involved in the life of the church as they are growing up through their formative years so that they see the church as an essential part of their faith and their service to Christ, not merely an appendage whereby they tip their hats to God one hour a week on Sunday morning. Too many parents are surprised when their children walk away from the Lord after they finish high school. Some studies, as we have noted to you in the past in some detail, have put that figure as high as 85% of young people who have grown up in the church abandoning their faith entirely when they reach their college years. <clears throat> this passage introduced us also to a very important young man who is about to step out in faith with very faltering steps to serve Christ at that time of history. We know only a little about him, John Mark. He's mentioned in a number of passages in the New Testament. He's called John in some of them. He's called Mark in some of them. But we discover that he's the same person as you read through the text. He's raised in a Christian home in Jerusalem. It was a strongly Christian home, obviously. They held the prayer meetings at their house. It was the first place Peter thought of to go. He knew that that was a place which was a home where Christ was honored. He's a young man who saw miracles take place in answer to prayer. He had first-hand experience as a result of what happened there that night. He's a relative of Barnabas because his mother was a relative of Barnabas. Barnabas was his uncle. More strong Christian family connections, how important that is. Young people many times go out and they marry an unbeliever or they marry into someone of a different faith. And all of a sudden you lose that tie, that connection, that interconnectivity that is so essential in the body of Christ. He's the spiritual son of Peter as we looked at, perhaps through the very incident that took place in the text that we saw. He was with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. We see them starting that missionary journey in the same chapter, but he left them at Perga, just a few verses down in the text here. Perhaps he was scared by the demonic confrontation, which occurs right before he leaves. John Mark was the reason for the fight between Paul and Barnabas. Dear friends, it's important to remember that our faithfulness or our lack of faithfulness does affect others. I am many times personally affected by the lack of faithfulness of some of the folks in this church. I appreciate those of you who are faithful, but there are some who cause great pain in my spirit because of their unfaithfulness. <clears throat> times that I count on people and they don't come through. Proverbs 25.19 says, Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Solomon compares the unfaithful man on whom you rely to a broken tooth or a foot out of joint. Some of you have had broken teeth. I've had broken teeth. You look at my mouth and you see that they're still that way. Over the many years of life, all the way since I was a young preteen, when I broke my first front tooth, uh, that was in a swimming pool. A second tooth that was broken while I was at scout camp in a river. We were swimming and another scout threw a rock and hit me in the mouth. Another tooth which was broken because of popcorn, which had a hard kernel in it. I know what it's like, that's pain. You try to bite down and suddenly there is intense, excruciating pain. That's what Paul felt when John Mark left them. Confidence in an unfaithful man is like a broken tooth. Just remember, when you're unfaithful and you don't do your responsibilities, what God has called you to do, when you drag your feet, when you deliberately avoid doing what you ought to be doing, you are hurting someone else. You're hurting the people who are depending 
on you. The other illustration he gives is like a foot out of joint. Now some of you have gone through foot problems. You know what that's like. On several occasions I have sprained one of my ankles. I can remember at seminary, I was walking down the stairs to the seminary post office carrying a huge stack of boxed reel-to-reel -reel tapes. That was a long time ago that they played reel-to-reel -reel tapes. We had the seminary radio program and I produced that every week. Recorded the various professors, put on the you know introductions, put on the closing, blended the music underneath and so on, in and out. And then I would mail them out to radio stations all over the United States to have those stations air the programs. And I'm carrying this down the stairs and I missed a step. And I fell perhaps 10 or 11 steps down and wrenched my ankle horribly. Incredible amount of pain. In Israel, that same ankle, that was the following year. It had just gotten better. I was climbing down the side of a mountain in Jerusalem and I slipped and fell and wrenched the same ankle again. Excruciating pain. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken foot or a tooth, or a broken tooth, not a broken foot, a tooth out of joint. That might hurt too, but a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Dear people, when you have something to do, you've been assigned to do it, you've been appointed to do it, or you know you ought to do it, just remember, you may cause pain. It caused a great deal of pain to the Apostle Paul to such extent that it caused Paul to have a fight with the man who was perhaps his very best friend. The man who had introduced him to the church at Jerusalem. The man who had brought him to the believers and told the believers that they could trust him after his conversion when no one trusted him. One unfaithful young man brought that fight. Now we know that God reconciled Paul and John Mark at the end of Paul's life, but the needless pain that was suffered, the needless division that was suffered because of an unfaithful man. It causes discouragement. It causes, as we see in the case here, anger. It causes harsh words. Just remember that when you think of John Mark, a believer, a young man who wanted to serve Christ, a young man who failed and later was restored, but a young man whose actions caused pain to others. We see John Mark was with Paul during his first imprisonment at Rome. We looked at passages dealing with that. We saw John Mark was at Ephesus with Timothy when Paul called for Timothy during his second imprisonment and asked Timothy to bring Mark with him to Rome. So we know a bad beginning can be redeemed. He's the author of the Gospel of Mark under Peter's direction with an emphasis on the deity of Christ. He began to realize the master that he was serving. And we find in that text, in verse 12, that many were gathered together praying. Praying. Not some, but many. I suspect the whole church was there for prayer meeting that night. How wonderful it would be if we could see the whole church here, gathered for prayer meeting. As we read that passage, we noted a number of things, and I want to add some things to that tonight. As Peter is going out of the prison, and as the angel leaves him, it says, Peter considered what he ought to do. That's a careful thought process that's involved in knowing the will of God. How often do you and I really consider and think about the precise will of God, or do we wake up in the morning, put it on automatic pilot, and mumble through the day 
with all kinds of twists and turns and have no idea what's going on. How often do we consider and think about doing the precise will of God? When you wake up in the morning, how much scripture is on your mind? We noted that Peter was able to sleep there in the prison probably because he was meditating on promises of the word of God. And we saw many of them, both in the Old Testament, that he would have learned well under Jesus, and many promises that Jesus made, any of which he could have been meditating on the night before he assumed he was going to die. We saw many were gathered praying, men included, this afternoon, I like to do this sometimes in, when I have a little extra time besides what I usually sleep on Sunday afternoon. I try to watch a video that I may be showing here at the church. And this afternoon, we looked at the video Behind the Sun. It's based on true stories coming out of the Middle East from Muslim countries, and so the Lord willing will probably show it at one of our fifth Sunday specials when we emphasize missions and evangelism and outreach. And in it, there is a pastor, much like the pastors who are in prison in Muslim lands today, who has been arrested, having a secret trial, and is going to be executed, and the Muslim country does not want the rest of the world to know about it. But there is a man who has released the information and so it hits the press. And it shows many, many, many churches praying for that man's release. When we show that, please don't miss. You need to understand the power of prayer still works today. You will be biting your fingernails and holding your breath as you go through this and watch that film and see how it unfolds. And the suffering that Christians in Muslim lands have today. Many were gathered. Peter knocked, he didn't just walk in. You know, it's rather interesting. In that night, the only door that didn't open for Peter was the church meeting. That night, the only door that didn't open for Peter was the church meeting. People were too busy doing what they thought was right to realize there's someone outside. How many do you know that are outside? Perhaps something they've said at one time sort of sparked your interest and you may have thought, oh, perhaps they'd be interested if I shared the gospel, but not now. The church delayed. A little girl was the only one who had faith to believe and she didn't know what to do. She tried, but didn't open the door. How many people that you know are outside and you haven't really opened the door for them? Rhoda's response was gladness. She wasn't afraid, even though they were hiding out. She had the faith of a child to believe, even if her actions were irrational. Even when the adults accused her of insanity, they said, you are mad. And then the adults came up with non-biblical theories as to what it might have been. And then the adults are astonished at the answer to prayer. It shows their lack of faith. But faith as a grain of mustard seed, Jesus said, moves mountains. We saw God was glorified because God did those things. And then we heard Peter tell them, go and tell the others. You've seen God at work. What are you doing to tell the others? And then the last thing we noted in that passage was Peter knew when it was time to move on. He didn't stay, even though the Christian fellowship was great. 
even though this is a great place to minister among motivated praying Christians. He knew when it was time to move on. That brings us to verses 18 and 19. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. Let me speak on that last phrase first. Herod heard the testimony of men that he trusted, but he was going to kill. It was the way Herod did things. Herod had not flippantly chosen a band of men who were halfwits. He had chosen hardened soldiers to guard the prison that night. He had not chosen a group of motley characters who couldn't speak the same language, gathered from different parts of the Roman Empire, who had not been through basic training. He gathered a group of 16 soldiers to guard Peter that night, who were a well-knit Roman unit, experienced in battle, experienced in the law of Rome, knowing that if they lost a prisoner, it would cost them their life. Herod, I think, was troubled after he examined the, those keepers. It's like Jerusalem is not a safe place for me to be. I need to get out of here. I need to get someplace where I have a lot more Roman protection. We'll talk more about Caesarea when we get farther into the book of Acts, but I think the reason Herod leaves at the end, from Herod's perspective, is that Herod didn't feel very comfortable staying around Jerusalem after Peter got away. From God's perspective, the reason that Herod left Jerusalem was God was about to judge Herod. We're going to see it in the next passage following this. God was about to judge Herod. He had given him every opportunity to hear and to believe. He had demonstrated himself powerful on Peter's behalf at the season of the year when Christ was crucified. When Christ rose again. That's what we saw when we saw why Herod chose that season to put Peter to death. Herod was given his opportunity. Herod rejected it. And Herod was judged. Now back to the first part of the text. As we look at this supernatural blindness, we learn at least three things. The supernatural blindness covered a large physical area about one city block square. A city block is a tenth of a mile. When you walk 10 blocks in New York City, you walk one mile. A city block is a tenth of a mile. Think of how big a city block is. Think of how many skyscrapers and underground passageways are within a city block. That's about the size of the prison into which Herod had placed Peter. It was a complex prison. It was a fortified prison. It was a prison in which there was not just four quaternions of soldiers. It was a prison that was loaded with soldiers. Soldiers at every gate, every exit. That's where the soldiers lived. They bunked there. There were soldiers on guard on the walls looking down at the streets below, looking down over the gates that went out into the city. There was a supernatural blindness that came not only on 16 soldiers way down in a dungeon. There was a supernatural blindness that blanketed that entire area. Peter wasn't trying to be quiet. 
Peter wasn't sneaking along the walls. Peter was stumbling along behind an angel. And it says that there was light in the prison. It wasn't because it was so dark. It was only dark for certain people. Supernatural blindness covering a large physical area. Secondly, we see supernatural blindness covering an extensive period of time. At least six hours went by, at least, if you figure midnight to 6 a.m., you got at least six hours. Six hours went by without the soldiers noticing that Peter was missing. Folks, if you are a Roman soldier assigned to guard a prisoner and you are chained to the prisoner inside the prisoner's cell and others standing right outside the door, do you think you're going to fall asleep under the reign of a man named Herod? There is a supernatural blindness which covered an extensive period of time. It wasn't five minutes later that they suddenly discovered it. It says, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. It was only as the natural light of day came on the prison that the soldiers suddenly realized Peter was missing. God gave Peter a humongous head start. <laughs> the third thing we learn about the supernatural blindness is it was with precise timing to fulfill God's purposes in two areas. Number one, to fulfill God's purposes in deliverance. Precise timing of deliverance. And number two, to fulfill God's purposes in the precise judgment of a specific group of men. I believe that you think, or I think that you believe, that God sovereignly ordains all that comes to pass. I hope you believe that. That nothing happens apart from his directive hand. That when he's working, especially in the life of believers, it is by a specific, divinely ordered plan. And so what we see here with these men is they are about to meet their maker. When Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Precise timing to fulfill God's purposes. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison. Nobody woke up except Peter. And even Peter had to be smacked on the side to get up. You know, timing and execution of judgment is determined by God not by the extent of wickedness. Somebody might say, well, maybe it's because those guys were really, really bad. I mean, you know how bad soldiers can be, and you know how sailors can be even worse than that. It was not because this particular group of men was more wicked than other men. You don't know the time that you will die. None of the wicked know the time that they will die. You know, we see both judgment and deliverance using pagan means and natural means, and Jesus talks about this in the Gospel of Luke. And he makes it clear that the reason that things happened was not because they were more wicked than someone else. Listen to Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Pilate was a nasty, mean Roman, just like Herod. And Herod spoiled a party one day. He got a bunch of Jews and killed them as they were offering their sacrifices and mingled their blood with it. Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except 
ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. It wasn't because they were the worst Galileans there were. They were most vile, filthy, degraded, sinful Galileans that there were. That's not why God used Pilate to kill them and mix their blood with their blood of their sacrifices. He gives another illustration. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. The reason that the judgment and the death of some comes when it does is not merely because they are wicked above all other sinners. God used those two illustrations in which he clearly said that was not the case to remind us all that unless we repent, we will likewise perish. Interesting, that happened at Siloam. That tower fell on those who were building it in Siloam and killed them. Because Siloam was also not only a place of judgment, it was a place of deliverance. John chapter 9. The man born blind, where did Jesus send him? He said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. The timing of execution of judgment and the timing of deliverance is determined by God. It may even be the same location where both of those things occur. We see that the same darkness and blindness that happened in that small area in Jerusalem also occurred in the Old Testament where there was light for one as there was light for Peter and there was darkness for the other. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17 and following. It came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, though that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. Four hundred years after Joseph died. And they took their journey from Sukkot and encamped at the time in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them in the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. That's the Shekinah, remember? It's giving them light in the night. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we let Israel go from serving us? Why have we done this? Do you remember the last ten plagues? God hardens people's hearts. Four times in the text it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Six times in the text it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. We are accountable, but God is in control. And he made ready his chariot and his people with him, took his people with him. He took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army. And he overtook them encamping by the sea beside Piharot before Baal Zephon. Um, Piharot means the mouth of the gorges. Baal Zephon, the master of the north. When we get to this passage in Exodus, those are key indicators of where this takes place. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. So how, what did God do? Listen. Listen, because this is what happened that night in the prison with Peter. The angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. 
And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God can bring blindness and darkness when he wishes. God can give light when he wishes. God can separate even those who are close to one another, one with darkness and one with light. It happened at the Exodus, which I think should have been a reminder to Peter that the same sovereign God who made Israel a nation, for that is the point at which they are becoming a nation when they cross the Red Sea, Israel becomes a nation in the sight of God. The same thing happens with Peter in the prison, where God is severing him out from the pagans around him, deliverance for one, judgment for the other, just like Egypt Deliverance for the children of Israel, judgment for Pharaoh and his army. Physical blindness in scripture is a type and a picture of spiritual blindness. Matthew fifteen fourteen, Jesus speaking, let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? I'm skipping verses to see how many times Jesus uses blind as a picture of spiritual blindness. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Blindness is a picture of spiritual darkness, and we see that happening in our text tonight in Acts. Peter had spiritual light as well as physical light, but all the guards and Herod and all that entire castle in which Peter was being chained was in darkness. The political sphere may be in total darkness, when God gives light to his people and deliverance. The next thing we notice about blindness in scripture and this darkness is that the healing of that blindness is the proof of the Messiahship of Jesus. Luke 4.18 The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Jesus is reading that from the prophet Isaiah in the synagogue, and it says he set down the book and said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He is the one who heals the brokenhearted, delivers the captives, recovers sight to the blind, sets at liberty those that are bruised. Luke 7. That same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And what was the question the disciples of John had asked? John is in prison. John sends his disciples, says, Ask Jesus, are you the one that we're supposed to look for, or should we look for somebody else? Are you the Messiah? And what Jesus does is he says, What have I just done? I've just given you the proof that I'm the Messiah. These are the prophecies that the Messiah would do these things. He doesn't say yes or no. He tells them, You just saw me heal the blind. A few verses later, down in verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. Do you think that was taking place that night in the prison? There were those who saw 
and they were made blind. Those are those who didn't see, they were sound asleep, and they were made to see there was a light that shined in the prison. Light for one, darkness for another. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. The stubborn heart that refuses to see the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ is doomed. The God of this world, Paul says, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Blindness is also a picture of the judgment of God. Acts chapter 13. We'll be getting there very shortly. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Blindness is a picture of the judgment of God. That night in the prison with Peter, it was dark, but it wasn't that dark, where you couldn't feel an attached prisoner. As soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death, and he went down from Judea to Caesarea and their abode. The soldiers did not look for Peter until it was daylight. How often do people wait to hear the truth until it's too late? You know, in prison situations, there's someone who checks at least once an hour on every prisoner. In many situations, there are even more often checks than that. They check not merely that the prisoner is there, but that no one has harmed the prisoner. They check to see that the prisoner has not committed suicide. Prisoners who have been in jail for any number of times soon learn the routine that the guards go through. But the guards have a regular checkup all night long. Nobody checked until it was daylight. The soldiers didn't look for him until it was day. The second thing we see is the soldiers were the first to look for him, this closely knit group of 16 men. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what was running through their minds. I wonder what they said to each other. Hey, do you think he ran down the hall to the men's room? <laughs> no, there's no way. Check all the rocks. Is there a secret tunnel here? Look on the floor. Are those chains, are the links in the chains broken? No, they're not broken. They're open. Have you got your key? Yeah, I've got my key. He didn't pickpocket me. He's gone. Do you think the soldiers had a few willies? Not merely about what was going to happen to them, but, whoa, that never happened before in a prison. Was the guy a ghost? All kinds of explanations other than the one that was the correct one. We're not told what Peter did before he went to sleep. We know what Paul and Silas did when they were in prison. They sang. They sang praises to God. They probably quoted Bible verses to each other. Peter was a bold witness. Peter wasn't scared. I suspect that Peter had shared the gospel with these hardened soldiers. I mean, Peter was willing to stand in the middle of the temple and preach the gospel of Christ in the very location where he knew he was going to get arrested. Peter didn't just sort of clam up and go to jail and hope for the best. Peter understood that Jesus had made him a witness. The question has once been asked, perhaps many times, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you. Would there? How often do you share Christ 
with those around you. Those guys were stuck with Peter that night. They couldn't walk out of the room. It wasn't like you're standing on a street corner and a bus comes and the guy says, hey, I'll talk to you later, and gets on the bus and goes away. How often do you share Christ? More time passed before Herod got up. The Herods were not known for their early rising, especially since they usually partied late until the night. But Herod finally gets up, and he decides, okay, today is the day to cut off Peter's head. He was planning it, you know. So Herod is the next person to look for Peter. And by the time Herod begins to look for Peter, there's no time for the soldiers to escape. You know, fear hinders our movements. So does sloth hinder doing what we ought to do. So does covetousness because we're tied down by things. So does lust because our focus is not on the danger that is coming down the path at us as we are involved in that lust. So does pride because we don't want to admit that we're not sufficient to handle the situation. So does every one of what have been called the mortal sins. They hinder your movement. The soldiers knew at break of day that Peter wasn't there. You know, I think that if I had been in that band of soldiers, I'd said, guys, you know, let's lock everything up. Let's go on leave and get out of here as fast as we can. Because in any case, we're dead men. If they find that he's not here and we were all here, even if we have the same story, we're dead men. So better to try to escape and maybe they'll catch us and maybe they won't if we split up and get out of these Roman clothes and we all have some place we can go. But you know, fear hinders movement. And then it says Herod had an examination, he had a judicial review of the keepers. Roman law was that if you're responsible for a prisoner and the prisoner escapes, the penalty is death. That was true in many ancient cultures. You remember, even in ancient Israel, the prophet comes before the king and he sullies his face, gets it dirty and says, hey, there was a battle going on and you know the prisoner got away when I was running here and there and doing my thing. And the king says, okay, you're going to die for that. And the prophet cleans his face off and says, actually, you just pronounced your own death sentence because you had Ahab and you let him go. There's an illustration, judgment, on one group of jailers here in our text. We find another similar situation where there's the deliverance of the jailer. Interesting, light, darkness, judgment, deliverance. We see it over in Acts chapter 16. There's a sovereign choice of God as to which were released and which were killed. And as we saw before, Herod in the first passage is being set up for slaughter. Now we get to Acts 16. We mentioned it a moment ago. It came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her the same hour. And when her master saw that their hope of gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive. <laughs> Such as casting out demons from demon-possessed girls who are slaves and we're using to make money on. Naughty, naughty boys they are neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates turned off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks, very much like what happened to Peter. Peter's in an inner prison, 
multiple soldiers guarding him, chained here they are in stocks. You've seen what stocks are like. These wooden things where your head and your hands and your feet are clamped down in boards and the thing is locked shut and you can't move? Very, very uncomfortable. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God and the prisoners heard them. They witnessed even in prison. And at midnight, middle of the night, I suspect this was about the time that the angel smote Peter on the side. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Now listen, an earthquake might open doors. An earthquake can shake the foundations of the prison, make things fall down. But everyone's bands loosed? How often does an earthquake unlock locks? It can pop a door open, but pop every lock open on stocks? Everyone's bonds were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. He knew the penalty if a prisoner escaped. Perhaps the bigger miracle here is that the other prisoners did not try to get away. Oh, we'll talk more about that when we get to Acts chapter 16. But in Acts 16, the jailer lives and is saved. In our text in Acts 12, the jailers die. They are judged. It's rather interesting that Paul then demands that the magistrates come and personally release them. They do. And then they leave. The prison, the magistrates discover they're Romans. Uh Uh-oh, we're in serious trouble. You couldn't do things like that to a Roman. Peter leaves the prison and goes away. Paul doesn't leave the prison and God still lets him go away. Proverbs 22, verse 3. We've mentioned these verses before. Verse 3 and 27, 12. Exactly the same wording in both of those verses. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Five chapters later. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Amos 5.13 Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, For it is an evil time. An interesting play back and forth. Open public witness. Also, a time of hiding. Can you put it together? That's what we're talking about here in the book of Acts. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the power of your word and for wisdom. You've told us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Father, help us not to be double-minded. Where we have one eye on Christ and one eye on the things of the world. It immobilizes us so that we cannot move quickly as we should, so that we cannot do what we ought, so we find ourselves caught in an evil snare when it falls upon us.
Father, we pray that you will bless this, your word, as it has gone forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.